So thank you for being here today in the presence of Christ and in a, in a spirit of prayer so that we may make this holy day and what it already is, but that it may echo in our hearts with all the fruitfulness that God wants for it. You know, I was thinking today about the theme of Christ's kingdom. And that's what we're going to be talking about as we move to the, from the arrest, which we saw yesterday in his agony. We need to segue into his trial by night in front of the Sanhedrin. And then before his trial before Pontius Pilate, where he is scourged and crowned with thorns. These are two very hefty mysteries, aren't they? They're in our rosary, and they get a lot of attention in our prayer, even though it's just like half a sentence in the Bible. Did you notice that? And it's like not even its own sentence, the fact that he was scourged. But what does it mean? And that's what we're going to explore today. But before we do, just a little story from my own life in the seminary. You know, when we would go on hikes in the um, Mount Washington when I was in the seminary in, in Connecticut, Whenever we'd hike uh, uh, up to the top of a mountain, you can imagine 70 of us in, in hike clothes going up these, these mountains, and we would race up as, much, as fast as we could. And when we got to the top, all of us, we would sing a chant, which went like this. Christus vincit, Christus regnat. Christus, Christus, imperat. It's really simple, isn't it? Do you get that? Christus vincit, Christ has conquered. Christus regnat, Christ reigns, and Christ will rule forever. That's the words of the song. And that's what we see when we look to Christ the King reigning on the cross, Christ the victor, Christ the conqueror. And yet, which centurion could possibly have picked that out, right? Jesus, conqueror? He's crucified. He's mocked. How in the world do we see a victorious warrior on the cross? And so only when you dive into the scripture can you get to the bottom of this mystery. And so that's what we're going to do today. All right, so Christ is scourged and then crowned with thorns. Those are, of course, the mysteries that you remember after the agony. But we have to connect the dots a little bit, don't we? Yesterday, for those of you who are with us, we visited the agony. We saw how Jesus prayed three times, let this cup pass from me. But then he added... Not my will, yours be done. He was ready to drink the bitter cup, a symbol of the sins of all mankind. And this is so dramatic that it plays out in his body like this. Luke, the doctor, the beloved physician, as Paul calls, it, calls him, records these words that he was in such agony that his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. And it's the medical journals that describe hematidrosis, right? That your subcutaneous capillaries explode and this hemorrhaged blood exits out of the capillaries. Little red dots will appear all over the surface of the skin, leaving you sensitive to touch. And so the kiss of Judas registered as physical pain because his skin was fr fragile and tender due to hematidrosis. And that makes sense because a, a kiss ought to have been a sign of loyalty and friendship. He turns that upside down and makes it the sign of his betrayal. And that kiss is like a sword in the heart of the Savior. To quote one of the Psalms, remember Christ himself will speak of swords on Mount Olivet. He'll say, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. That's a quote from Zechariah 13, which said, Awake, O sword, and strike the shepherd. Well, what sword strikes the heart of Christ? Could it be Judas's kiss? His intimate friend, his companion, one of the chosen twelve, betrays him, and in this way, with a kiss. How appropriate, then, that this is what ushers in all of the sufferings that we are about to see. 
And tonight it all begins after the Last Supper. Jesus is arrested and brought to the Sanhedrin. And this passage is absolutely critical. It's what plays out tonight. After the liturgy, we remember how Jesus was captured and brought before Caiaphas. And even though all of the false witnesses can't make a case against Jesus, Jesus makes the case for them. Because he was like a lamb led to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth as they brought forth these false charges. And yet, when Caiaphas sees that Jesus is slipping through his fingertips, he says, I'll take matters into my own hand. And he stands up and says, I exorchizo you. That's a fancy word just to say. Orchizo means to swear an oath. Exorchizo means to put someone else under a solemn oath. Here is the high priest telling Jesus, I adjure you. Answer me this. Are you the Christ? Are you the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Son of God? And Jesus, who had been so well disciplined up until this point, not saying a word, letting them make a botched job of this trial. So if he just continues in this line, he can sleep in his own bed that night. They've got to make a case against him. Until this question, Jesus says, oh, have I got something to say to that? Am I the Christ, the Son of God? Ego eimi, he says. I am. Right? Echoing Exodus 3.14, when God revealed his own name right, to Moses in the burning bush, I am who am. You think that's a good time for Jesus to use that kind of language? <laughs> they're itching to put him to death. He serves up on a silver platter everything they're looking for. Just for good measure, let's go ahead and quote two key messianic passages from the Old Testament. Daniel 7, 13 and 14, and Psalm 110 the most quoted of all passages in the New Testament from the Old Testament. And so Daniel 17 goes, goes on to say, And you shall see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus, what are you doing? Right? Well, what he's doing is making it crystal clear just who it is he says that he is so that we might not doubt what he claims for himself. Are you the Messiah, the Davidic king? Oh yeah, right? I'm one like the Son of Man, coming on the clouds of heaven. You know that messianic era that you guys are looking for? It's here, it's now, and you will see it. When will we see him reigning? On the cross. There he is enthroned, in glory. What could be more inglorious than the cross of Christ? Nothing, no death more ignominious, no, no greater shame. This is to debase, to dehumanize a man, is to scourge him and treat him like a beast, as we shall see. So, Jesus is the one who sets the spark to this chain of events. By the, by the confession of who he says that he is. I am the Christ. I am the Son of God. What do you say to that? He's deserving of death. And they cart him off to punch his pilot in the morning. And after a night in chains, certainly going without breakfast, Jesus then is presented before this procurator. How ironic, Right? Here is Jesus, the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, submitted to a measly procurator. The Jews are supposed to reign over all the earth, right? Isn't that what they were expecting? And the Messiah would be the first one to inaugurate this new kingdom. You know, meanwhile, the, the nations have been taking turns, taking turns ruling over Israel. What a shame. And here is Jesus entering into that shame submitting himself to a Roman proxy 
for a long, a faraway Caesar. How is this the, the show of power that the Jews were awaiting? And yet it is, if only we have the eyes to see it. But as we saw yesterday, the grayscale on the shroud is inverted. And what did the Pope say? So it is in real life. In other words, unless you have eyes to see, you'll miss the true image. You'll trade the positive for the negative. You won't be able to call that Friday Good Friday because you won't be able to see in it a paradox of hope. You'll only see darkness. You'll only see pain. Jesus gives us the clues so, so we can unlock the mystery. I want to look again to this face, but what do we see now if we put down our Bibles and look with the eyes of a scientist for a moment to understand what he suffered? This is interesting. The American scientists note that the nose is broken. Not, not the nasal bone up top, but the septum, the cartilage at the tip of the nose is separated because there was a cudgel, there was a club that was 1.5 inches in diameter that was used to strike the face. Do you know, in the Greek, we get two different verbs for strike. One is to slap with the hand. Another is to strike with a club. That is evidenced on the shroud as well. We have inflammation in the right cheek. An excoriation, that's a triangular, that passes about, if you come two-thirds down the nose, it moves over to the left side of the cheek, and there we have new excoriations. Also abrasions over the lip and on the eyebrow. He was pummeled, he was beaten in a brutal way. But what the shroud can't tell you, what your microscope cannot reveal, is why they strike him. And that's where you got to go back to the to the passage we, we were just considering. Christ before the Sanhedrin. And we, when he says that momentous claim, I am, I am what? I am the Christ, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Son of God. That's the climax that brings to conclusion the starting point of the very gospel. Do you remember Mark 1 verse 1? The beginning of the gospel of who? Jesus Christos, Jesus Christ, comma, the Son of God. That's who he is, and that's what's announced from the beginning. But the disciples didn't have the luxury of knowing that at the start. In time, that was revealed. And at the end of the story, it's finally, with great clarity, announced by Christ himself. I am the Christ and the Son of God. And they strike him. They blindfold him. And then they strike him and say sarcastically, prophesy. You're so great, high and mighty. Who is it that struck you? That's what Matthew and Luke will add. I like Mark's version best. That's the one we read this year in the liturgical cycle. B. He doesn't add those little words, who is it that struck you? You know what he just says? As they strike him, Many of us pronounced it wrong when I was in Washington and Seattle celebrating this, and some were saying, prophecy. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's a command, it's a verb. They're saying, prophesy as they strike him. And there's irony in this. What's the object of the prophecy? Is, it just, is Jesus just meant to say, oh, the guy's name is Malchus. That's the guy who delivered the punch. It's much deeper than that. It's much, more, it's much more dark and wonderful, mysterious. What Christ is actually doing in this moment is not only prophesying, he's actually fulfilling the prophecy. Was it not he who said that very night to Peter, you will deny me three times before the cock crows? What's Peter doing outside while Jesus stands before Caiaphas? Warming himself by the fire as they accuse him. Jesus is fulfilling the prophecy. He announced three times that he would be handed over to the Jews, crucified, and then he would rise on the third day. And here it is, being played out in real time, and they're mockingly accusing him, prophesy, you prophet. Little do they know that they are revealing the prophet. They are revealing the king of kings as they crown him, as we shall soon see.
Do they have intention of doing so? Hardly. This is the kind of poetry that only God can write. Right? They're revealing the King of Kings. They're exalting him. They're glorifying him on the cross. They have no intention of revealing divine love. And yet they play into his plot just as they think Jesus is a victim of theirs. This is the God we serve. Uh, infinite in intelligence. You know, bold in wisdom, but above all, infinite love is what's revealed here on the cross. That's the glory. Glory, I'll take just a moment to explain this because I just came from Rome and I was thinking about it this morning, praying about this. Didn't we read just recently in the liturgy that Christ would be glorified? Isn't that what he prays at the end of chapter 12 in John's gospel? What shall I pray at this hour? Save me from this hour. But for this hour I came. Father, glorify your son. And so we pass into chapter 13 and following, which is after the book of signs, chapters 1 through 12, we open the book of glory. Christ who is on the cross revealed as king of kings. It's a glorification. It's an enthronement. It's an exaltation. When I have been lifted up, Jesus says, I will draw all men to myself. Where is he lifted up? Where is he exalted? On the cross. It's a paradox, which is why so many of us missed it that day on Good Friday. Only now, looking back after the resurrection, do we see what was really being done. Jesus wasn't being conquered by the powers of darkness. He was conquering the powers of darkness himself by taking the blow upon, by drinking the bitter cup, but then rising to new life. So this motif continues, and I want to move forward now as, as we look to the crown. You'll see here, if we just step back just one moment, you see that um, flow of blood at the top of the forehead? I want to look just for a moment with the eyes of a scientist so you can see how how important these details are. If I had to pick just one element from the shroud that makes the strongest argument for authenticity, that is to say that the shroud actually belongs to the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived 2,000 years ago, this is what I'd point to. On the shroud, we have over 30 puncture wounds covering the entire surface of the head. We have two flows of blood in particular. One is from the frontal vein, right here in the, the front of the, the brow. But we have arterial blood flowing straight and narrow on the sides. We can differentiate blood which flows from a frontal vein and an artery. Could we do that in the Middle Ages, you think? Although many people continue to believe that the shroud is a medieval fake. This is the work of a con artist, they would say. And yet these details are so strikingly realistic. The furled brow shows how the muscles spasm, right, when pierced by, by a thorn. This, we've never seen in artwork portrayals like this. A crown that is more like a cap. I'll show you images in just an instant. But I want to show you that it's not just the crown, but it's a series. Even if we just took the crown and, comp and compiled that with the crucifixion, nails in the hands and feet, those two elements alone, crucifixion and crown, converge on just one candidate. Make a list of all the crucified men who also were crowned with thorns and how many men make that list? Exactly one. What is the chances then that this man, the man of the shroud, is not Jesus Christ when we have a very unique combination of pathologies that have been suffered here? A lance in the side, as we shall soon see. A, sc a scourging the whole length of the body from the, to from the ankles up to the shoulders and the crown of thorns and the nails in the hands. This is a photographic negative image that shows the scourge wounds. I'm not sure if you can make it out, but we have over 360 lead balls. That's what was tied to the end of the leather straps. The, there are different types of flagra or whips that the Romans used. Some had jagged bone at the end of, the, at the end of those straps. Others had lead balls. And that's what was called later on in history the flagrum taxilatum. 
this is what's evidenced on, on the shroud. We have these, these lead balls that appear on the whole length of the body, not just the back, as I assumed until I studied the shroud, but it's the front and the back. He's absolutely naked. No protective loincloth. The wounds are just as deep in the pelvic region as everywhere else on the body. It was meant to humiliate and debase you, which is exactly why Deuteronomy 25 says, if you scourge your brother in the synagogue, actually it's a different word we should use, it's a flogging that the Jews used. The Roman scourging was something altogether different. But yes, the Romans, the, the, the Jews rather, had a kind of cat of nine tails, a kind of leather straps that, but they would never exceed 40 lashes. Why not? Deuteronomy 25 says, lest you debase your brother. In other words, to scourge is to, to treat a man as an animal, as a stupid beast. That was the whole point. The Romans wanted to transmit just that kind of message. They would scourge you as if to say, you don't even have the dignity of a man. You're more like a beast. What would Jesus pray from the cross if not Psalm 22? I am a worm and not a man. And so it is, that's how they treated him. Paul was scourged five times in the synagogue, but he was a Roman citizen. And so he was exempt from Roman scourging. That was his prerogative as a citizen. See then the irony as they scourge Jesus. What are they saying? You're not worthy of citizenship here in Rome. You're not even worthy to be called a man. The irony is this, that as we strip him of his dignity, what is he doing for us? By his stripes, we were healed, says Isaiah 53. See, he's vesting us with his majesty, with his divinity, by the very work that he accomplishes on the cross. And so his humanity is debased. He became man so that we might become gods. That sounds heretical. If it weren't in the catechism, I don't think I could quote it myself. But it's from the fathers of the church speaking on the incarnation. They say this is the divine exchange. He took on our human nature so that in our nature he might redeem it. Right? He steps into solidarity with sinners so deeply that 2 Corinthians 5 will say this. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become what? The righteousness of God. As he scourged, we are healed. This is the mystery that we can only unlock if we see the paradox. And so it continues. These scourge wounds are everywhere all over the body. Unlike any other artistic representation in our churches, in our holy paintings, if this is the work of a con artist, why is he so highly original? Right? Why does he de depict a naked Christ? What statue, what holy card shows that? And yet we know that this is a much more realistic depiction based on the first century literature. You were scourged right before you were crucified. It was part and parcel of a death sentence. Except that what do we read in John chapter 18 and 19? That three times Pontius Pilate will say, he is innocent, I find no cause in him. Therefore I shall have him scourged and released, he says. Think of it. I mean, it's not very logical, obviously. He's saying, he's innocent, therefore I'm going to scourge him. But what they're crying out is, crucify him. And he says, to satisfy their lust for blood, he says, I will beat him so badly to within an inch of his life, and then I'll parade him in front of one and all until you guys laugh at the proclamation that I say, Ecce homo, behold the man. Ecce rex, behold the king. Did he really proclaim Christ's kingship? No. It was laughable to think that this was a threat of a man, that this was a true king. They were supposed to say, enough already. It, let this poor guy go home, this wretch, he's no threat anymore. If anybody thought him a great, a, a great man, well, now he's been so 
terrifically debased and publicly humiliated that he's not going to cause any problems anymore. Except Punch's pilot plan flopped, didn't it? Because they just cry out even louder, crucify him. And so Christ was not only scourged, he was also crucified. Because he received a double sentence that day. Against the law. Double jeopardy is on the books today. It was back on the books way back then, too. Two sentences for one crime. It's against the law. Two sentences for no crimes is what Jesus gets. And even though he's scourged head to toe, that's not enough. Here's the, the reconstruction. If you, if you see the, the flagrum and how it corresponds to these lead balls, each and every one of them corresponds to a third-degree burn as far as the damage that it does to the, the skin, the, the body. It's, it's not altogether clear whether he, he bled because of it. Some think it was just an ecchymosis or a type of bruise. Others think it, it formed a kind of welt on the surface of the skin, and that's why it's registered when the body's in contact with the cloth that lies on top. I, I'm more inclined to the second view just from what I've heard from the forensic doctors. But in any case, he was built, beat to within an inch of his life. No wonder he dies so quickly. Do you remember how Pontius Pilate is astonished that he's already dead when um, the, the secret disciple of Arimathea, Joseph, goes and asks him for the body? What? He's already dead? You could last two weeks on the cross, and you wouldn't be dead even though the crows had come and pecked out your eyes. This is so horrendous. We forget. We are so used to seeing the cross on the wall. We tie it around our necks as a piece of decoration of jewelry. That's like wearing an electric chair around your neck or, or a lethal injection. It was unthinkable in the first century to think of this as something glorious. It was unspeakable. It was the sumum supplicium. It was written, the, the most horrendous and all, the most debasing of all tortures possible. So much so, Paul will have to say, as a prelude to his gospel, I am not ashamed of the cross of Christ. Why would he even need to say that? Right? Do, do, do the Buddhists have to say, I'm not ashamed of Buddha's doctrine? Or, or Muhammad the same. I'm not ashamed of the Quran. And yet Christians had to preface their proclamation with this. I am not ashamed of the cross. Why? Because it would have looked like shame for everyone everywhere. This is proof that our religion is not the invention of man. Because no one in his right mind would start a religion with the cross. It just makes no sense. No better way to disqualify a teacher than by saying he suffered the shame of the cross. The crown now of thorns. Look at what a surprise is waiting for us on the shroud. It's not a circlet that we see on this linen. It's not like a band around the ears that leaves the top of the head exposed. Instead, rather, what we find is that it's a cap, a helmet of thorns. You've seen the reconstruction here before you. In fact, so there it is. There's a little idea of what it must have looked like. It does say that these Roman soldiers um, interwove, they, they wove a crown of thorns. Don't think that these Roman centurions, these tough guys, are going to spend three and a half hours making a beautiful braid that goes just around the ears like, I don't know, a, a piece of jewelry or something. No, it was more likely that they lopped off a mess of thorn and then just pressed it down with their swords on his head. But they probably held the thorns together with like a wicker, a, a pliant branch of some sort that went around the ears just so that it would stay fixed to the head. Here's a reconstruction, as you'll see it in many of the museums throughout the world. This is recreated with the Zisiphus spina Christi, the Latin name of the genus and species of that plant, actually corresponds in Latin to the words thorns of Christ. Apparently, a tradition recalled that this was the plant that was used to cover the head of the Savior. Those thorns are three quarters of an inch long. The forensic doctors are therefore agreed that they press not just through the skin, but all the way to the bony plate below. 
Those thorns may be flexible, supple when green, but once they oxidize and harden, they're like nails. And so that would certainly cause a lot of pain. But brothers and sisters, we have got to go deeper than that in our contemplation. When you look to the cross, when you look to the crown of Christ, what do you see? What do you pray? What do you think? What do you meditate? Just that those thorns really hurt really bad? Beyond the pain, part of it is moral, spiritual. It's interior, right? They're mocking his kingship. Oh, you're a king? Kings need a crown. And, and that's part of the pain. But beyond that, there's more. And that's what I want to do in the remainder of this talk. Understand what does the crown reveal about his kingship. Everyone is agreed that at the center of the gospel is the kingdom. Right? Isn't that Jesus' opening words? The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay. We're agreed it's at the core of what Jesus came to proclaim. What does it mean? Not an easy question, right? Who's ready to give a discourse uh, to explain the kingdom of God? Even Jesus couldn't do it simply, it seems, right? I love this question. In the Gospel of Mark in particular, he says, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It's like even Jesus doesn't have words to do it justice. And so all he can do is speak in parables. Oh, it's so great, the kingdom of God. I propose to you that on the cross of Christ, that is where we see the kingdom. That is where the glory of the kingdom of God shines through his broken humanity. This is ironic. This is paradoxical. At the very moment they're mocking his kingship is when they're revealing what's true and unique about his kingship. Have you ever stopped to think about the language of king of kings? Do you know that the, the Jews have a very simple language? They don't, they don't have superlative you know how we say something is strong, some, someone is stronger, and someone is strongest? They don't have that subtlety in their language. So what do they do when they want to say there's a really big king? Well, they use this language. The king of kings. The lord of lords. Right? It, we even see this. The song of songs is one of the books of the Old Testament. As if to say... The quintessential song is this, the love of God for his people, right? So who is the king of kings? He stands apart from all the rest. Yeah, he's a king, but he doesn't wear a crown of gold. Why? Because he's different than all the rest. He transcends all the rest. And so there's continuity, yes, with the Davidic kings of the past, but above all, there's discontinuity. Isn't that what Jesus said? You can't put new wine in old wineskins. Why? Because they'll burst. There's something so new, so radically novel, that Jesus is going to stand out from all the rest. And we're cued into this motif right from the start. And you know who helps? The devil himself. He's the one who's claiming kingship at the start. Remember when Jesus goes into the desert, right? And there he's tempted three times by Satan. Look at Luke chapter 4. It says this. This is at the start of the gospel. And the devil took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I will give all this power, all this authority and their glory. For it has been delivered to me, says Satan, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And so you got to ask at the start of the gospel, who's got all the authority? Is it Jesus or is it Satan? You know, the, it comes as a question at the start. It's not resolved until the very end. 
of the story. But Jesus himself will call Satan the ruler of this world. He's a prince, right? And yeah, he's got authority. And this, this is unleashed in the world even to this day. It's a great mystery that an almighty God should allow the powers of darkness to work their, to work their agenda in some way, to try to destroy us. But what Jesus is going to show himself to be at the end is not just one more Lord, not just one who kind of dukes it out with Satan and shows him to, to himself to be the stronger man, but he's not even on a loving playing, level playing field with, this, with Satan. He's going to show himself to be infinitely stronger, such that there's not even a fight. Okay, so watch how this gets played out. But I want you to notice this motif right from the beginning. Who's got the kingship? Who's got the authority? Who's got the power? Satan or Jesus? I believe that it's the crown of thorns that is one of those most powerful windows into to the answer to that question. So we're asking ourselves, what does the crown of thorns reveal about the kingship of Christ? Okay, so we rightly read the kingship motif into the crown. It's right on the surface of the text. Remember in Mark 15 when they crowned him? Look at this royal imagery. They clothed him in a purple cloak. It's the king who wears purple. And plating a crown of thorns, they put it on him, they salute him. Hail! king of the Jews, and they strike his head with a reed and spat upon him, and they knelt down in homage to him. So there's no doubt that in the mind of the soldiers, what they're doing is mocking a kingship that they actually don't see, and so they sarcastically allude to it in this way. But there is a kingship, if only we had the eyes to see it. Watch how the crown reveals this. Notice that it's not just a belt of thorns. It's not thorns that he has to step on. It's a crown. And so look now to the Bible to, to, to decipher this code, the crown of thorns, which I think we look to a lot, but we contemplate too little. What does it mean that it was a crown of thorns? Does anybody remember the first time thorns appear in the Bible? Feel free to shout it out if, you, if, you gotta, if you're thinking of it. I'll give you, it, it is in Genesis. Whereabouts in Genesis? After the fall, exactly, right at the beginning, almost. Right, so Genesis 1 and 2 describe the paradise before the fall. And in, in 2 in particular, look at this verse where it says that the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and out of the garden the Lord God made to spring up every tree, well, not every tree, but every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. All right, so thorns are not in the mix just yet at the end uh, or at the beginning, I suppose, of chapter two. When do they debut? Right after Adam eats of the forbidden fruit. This is what the Lord God says to him in punishment. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the fruit of which I said you shall not eat it cursed be the ground because of you thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you look at this the cosmic effects of man's sin it's the ground that will be cursed and what shape does that curse take if not the shape of thorn and so what do you think becomes a symbol of sin from Genesis 3 onward? Thorns. And or more specifically, thorns and thistles. Right? That's the language we find in Genesis 3. It's the same language we find on the lips of Jesus in his first sermon. The Sermon on the Mount. Jesus shows himself to be aware of Genesis 3. He knows that thorns are a symbol of sin. And he uses this exact symbolic language when he says, beware of false prophets. They're like ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. And so you're going to say, well, Jesus, how am I going to know? How am I going to be able to pick them out in a crowd if they're disguised in this way? 
And so Jesus gives them a criterion. He says this, you'll know them by their fruit. A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree, bad fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorns? Are figs from thistles? Thorns and thistles. I guess Jesus was really interested in agriculture in Matthew 7, right? He's all about farming when he's alluding to figs and grapes. No, obviously, this is moral discourse. He's talking about virtues when he says the figure of figs and grapes. He's talking about vice. He's talking about evil. So Jesus knew that thorns mean sin, just as he knew that he would be crowned with thorns. Put that together and what do you get? That Jesus on the cross, when he's wearing this crown of thorns, he's saying without even opening his lips, I am the sin bearer. I bear the sins of the world. I want you to see how this plays out as we look more to the scriptures because notice that it's not just thorns anywhere, right? We could have pressed those thorns into his back, right, or his legs. I mean, that would have caused pain just the same. But it's that these thorns are placed on his head. I think that's actually theologically significant because if you go back to the scriptures, what you'll see is many expressions like this one in Psalm 7. It says of the evildoer, his mischief, returns upon his own head. And watch the parallelism here. And on his skull, his violence descends. In other words, you do violence, get ready, it's going to come back to you. What goes around, comes around. That's what Psalm 7 seems to be saying. In fact, it's something very similar we find in Esther chapter 9. Do you remember Haman, the one who puts Mordecai, the innocent Jew, to death? But before he's able... His evil plot is found out. And so, guess who is put to death on the very gallows he prepared for the innocent man? The evil one, Haman himself. And so we read in Esther 9 that the king gave orders in writing that Haman's evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on his own head. And that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. This is famously depicted in Michelangelo's the Sistine Chapel, right? Obviously, because we see a kind of relationship with the, sal- the plan of salvation in Christ. Watch how this plays out. But notice this. It's not just anywhere that this evil returns. The idiomatic expression to say what goes around comes around is this. The evil one's evil returns upon his own head. What's the problem with this? Jesus doesn't have any sins. He's not the evil one. But I want you to see I'm not making this up. Look quickly to 1 Kings chapter 2. There it's the son of David, King Solomon, who replies, do as Joab said, strike him down, bury him, and thus take away from me and from my father's house, what? The guilt for the blood that Joab shed without cause. The Lord will bring back his bloody deeds on his own head. So evidently, Joab has been up to no good. He killed a man, but without cause. Well, what goes around comes around, and when it does, see how this expression is used again and again. I don't think I'm just making this up. I really think it's in the scriptures, and Jesus would have been aware of such things. He would have been especially aware of the ritual on Yom Kippur, Do you know what? Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. This is the way God deals with our sins. This is the way he makes right that which was set wrong by our sin. At one minute, we talked about that yesterday, right? We are alienated, separated from God because of sin. But we we come back into communion by an act of expiation. How do you translate expiacion in Spanish into English at one mint. Atonement means expiation. How is it accomplished? Well, here's what you did in the Old Testament. The, the um, Levitical priesthood was played out like this. The priest would 
place his hands on a vicarious victim, on a goat. And he would do this. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it what? The iniquity, right? That is the sin of all the people of Israel and their transgressions, all their sins. He shall put on them, on what? On the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness. So notice that in order to communicate the sins of the people to this vicarious victim, we lay hands on the head, and that's symbolic of a transferal of the guilt of the people to the, this animal that dies instead, we suppose, in the wilderness as it's cast out from the camp, away from the people. That's how we get rid of sin, I suppose. Do you know there's no explanations of the Yom Kippur ritual that actually explain this, I don't know, in abstract terms, how atonement works. All we get is these signs, these symbols. And then we find that they rhyme with what Jesus accomplishes on the cross. Because on his head, as we shall see, lies the iniquity of us all. That's the language that we get in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, which Jesus himself will quote in the New Testament. Behind Jesus' vision of atonement is Isaiah 53, which we'll read tomorrow in the liturgy, by the way. But he was pierced, not for his transgressions, but for ours. He was crushed, not for his iniquities, but for ours. And upon him was the chastisement that didn't bring him shalom, it brings us peace. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Doesn't that sound like Leviticus 16? When the, the priest laid on the iniquity on that vicarious victim that would die in the wilderness. And so what we have here is a kind of representative substitute that Jesus takes upon himself a debt that he doesn't owe because we owe a debt that we can't pay. And so he's this quintessential representative of the people, the one who suffers the fate of all sinners, even though he's not a sinner. So what does it look like when the sins of all the people are transferred to that one victim? It looks like thorns on the head. See, we saw how thorns represent sin. We saw that evil, when it comes back to one, it looks like this. It's placed on the head. If you put that together, what do you get? I want to get, take you to Genesis 22, perhaps the most important Old Testament passage that illuminates the crown of thorns. I know you know this well. It's the story of Abram, who was renamed, right? Because even though he was born outside in Mesopotamia, far from the land of promise, this man whose name means exalted father, God renames so that he might be called Abraham, which means father of a multitude. That was the covenant with Abraham, that his descendants should be as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sands in the sea. How many kids does Abraham have according to the covenant? One, Isaac. And yet he's called to offer him up as a holocaust, a sin offering on a mountain. Which mountain? Moriah. Do you know what stands on Mount Moriah to this day if you go to Israel? It's the Temple Mount because that's where they build the temple. And year after year, for long centuries, they were slaying the Passover lambs at this very spot. Why did they pick that spot? Because of what happened with Abraham that day. See, God told him to offer his only beloved son, and he didn't understand, but he got up early in the morning anyway, and off he went to that mountain that the Lord designated to him, Mount Moriah. And then picture the scene. The only beloved son is carrying the wood of the sacrifice up the mountain. He says, hey, Dad, here's the wood for the sacrifice. Where is the lamb? And what does Abraham say? 
God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. God will provide. But did he provide a lamb for the burnt offering? Not on that day, right? Because we remember what happens. The angel stays the hand of Abraham before the knife descends and says, do no harm to the boy now that I know that you fear God because you, not, you have not withheld your son, your only beloved son. And so he wheels about, and what does he see behind him? Behold, not a lamb. Behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Think of it. The head is wrapped in thorn. And this will be the victim that dies instead of the only beloved son. And so God will provide a lamb. That was the promise. And yet it wasn't provided. Not on that day. They remembered those words. They renamed the mountain. This is the end note of that passage in Genesis 22. They renamed that mountain Yahweh Yireh. The Lord will provide. And when is that day on which the Lord provided the Lamb of God? How about chapter 1 of the Gospel? When John the Baptist, from afar, sees Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Isn't that a weird thing to say to somebody? Why are we calling a man a lamb? It's weird only if we don't know the Old Testament. Only if we forget the promise. God will provide a lamb. A lamb who takes away the sins of the world. That's what John was looking for. And that's what he saw when he saw Jesus. But when was Jesus seen to be this lamb of God? When was he a holocaust? When was he offering atonement for the sins of the world? Good Friday. When on Mount Moriah, he offers an atoning sacrifice on the cross. And what are they mocking him, if not with these words? You're the Savior, right? You saved others. Save yourself. Come down and we'll believe in you. In other words, Jesus, show us your horns. Right? Think of that imagery. If you are a ram, what do you do with your horns? When someone comes charging at you, how do you defend yourself, if not by charging right back? Jesus, you're pinned to the cross. Yeah, but come on, you're the Son of God. You're the Christ. Reign, King of Kings. Flex your divine muscle. Show us your horns. You know what Jesus is saying, in effect? You want to see power? I'll show you power. I'll die and on the third day rise, just as I said I would. But for the time being, my horns are wrapped in a thicket, right? And so Jesus isn't hiding his divinity. He's revealing it. Just as they're mocking him, he's saying this, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I've got the power to lay it down. I've got the power to take it up again. This isn't the veiling of divine strength. This is the unveiling of divine strength. Jesus revealing himself to be king of kings. And that's why it had to be a crown, a symbol of authority, a, th a symbol of kingship, as we saw, right? Here's a surprise. Here's a curveball. Look to the first instance of crown in the Bible, and guess who wears one? It's not a king at all. It's the priest. Exodus 29 speaks of the priesthood. It says this, You shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. And you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Do you know who is the Mashiach in the Old Testament? Who's the anointed one? It's not just the king. Three offices received an anointing. Priest, prophet, and king. Which one is Jesus? All three. Which one does he reveal himself to be in his passion? All three. Jesus isn't just king. He's a priestly king. He's the one who offers a sacrifice. 
and he is the one being offered. And so he, it's appropriate that he wear a crown because that's the figure in the Old Testament who wore one. Look at this. And this is, continues. Um, Take from the silver and the gold and make a crown and set it on the head of Joshua. I, I, I can't remember. I'm going to flash forward. What, what's the verse from this? I want to say it's Nehemiah 6. But it, it describes after the Babylonian, Babylonian captivity. Right? The people, when they're in exile, this is a symbol of and consequence of the sin of the people. That they're cast out of the land of promise, banished from the land of milk and honey. And now they are suppressed under the yoke of Babylonians, these pagan peoples. And so God will draw them out of captivity in the return. This will be a kind of new exodus as they move back into the promised land. But look who's in a leadership position as they are brought back out of captivity. Take from, take from them silver and gold, make a crown, and set it on the head of Jesus, on Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear royal honor. He shall sit and rule on his throne. You know that... Oh, okay. So I, I'll pause there just to say this. In the Old Testament, you have two figures that lead the people back into the land of promise. The king and the priest. And it's the priest who shares the throne, who wears a crown. Isn't that fascinating? If we fast forward to Jesus, what we'll find out is that in one person, the person of Christ, those two offices converge. Jesus will be priest and king. He's on the throne. He wears a crown. But he is quick to note that his kingship is very different from the kingship of the pagans. And so in Matthew 20, he says this. Do you remember when um, Peter and James asked to sit at the right hand, but through their mother? <laughs> they weren't courageous enough to ask themselves, so I guess they send their mom. You ask. Yeah, he'll, he'll say yes to you. But what does Jesus say in response? He doesn't re reply to the mother. He turns to them and says, can you drink the cup that I will drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? Yeah, we can. They have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> and Jesus says this, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones, kata exitziadzo, literally, to, they... They wield authority down upon the other. They exercise authority over them. Right? It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be a, a great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. All right, so Jesus, notice the juxtaposition. Notice the antithesis he sets up. Gentile lords wield it over. They lord it over their, their subjects. Not in my kingdom, says Jesus. Who's the first? The one who's last, right? Who's the king? Well, the one who's slave. It's an upside-down kingdom, which is exactly why no one was prepared to receive it. It's exactly why Jesus wouldn't receive the title Messiah, because they, he knew that they would misconstrue that terminology, thinking of a glorious king. When Jesus said, you want to you wanna know what it means to be Christ? I'm going to die on the third day rise. That's when I'll reveal the paradigm for my kingdom. It's upside down. See, Jesus is the kind of king, he's the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Isn't that the exact opposite of what the world think kingship is and what Satan proposes at the beginning of the gospel. That's what he does. He lords it over his subjects. And, and with an iron rod, he breaks them down. Right? Jesus is the humble servant. How does he win our allegiance? 
not with a club, but on the cross by saying this, will you not love me, I who have loved you so much and like this? Will you not wield, yield to my yoke, I who am a gentle and meek and humble of heart? That is what the cross proposes, and that's what the catechism understands when it claims Christ as king. It says this, the coming of God's kingdom means the defeat of Satan's kingdom. If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, Jesus says, well then know this, the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, if I subjugate the powers of darkness, well then my proclamation of kingship is at the same time a proclamation of Satan's defeat. That's why his exaltation isn't a, a loss, it's a victory. The very same act that brings him into death is the very same act that proclaims a new exodus, liberty for those who are captive. The powers of darkness unleash on Jesus and light shines out of the darkness so that what is left behind but, but these dirty rags in an empty tomb, a symbol of sin and all of its destruction. And yet, it couldn't keep a good man down. <laughs> Jesus, risen from the dead, is vindicated and shows himself to be king of kings. And so with this I'll end. The catechism says this, that the kingdom of God is definitively established through Christ's cross. And then it quotes the liturgy to say, God reigned from the wood. Christus vincit. Christus regnat. Christus imperat. Christ has conquered Christ rules, and Christ will reign forever. Amen. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Heavenly Jesus, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, thank you for revealing to us on your cross just what it means that you reign, that you rule. Thank you for being a paradoxical Lord, not one who lords it over your subjects, but one who gave your life who laid it down so that I might live. Lord Jesus, I am happy to enter into your kingdom, to subject myself to your lordship as I pray every time I take up the Our Father. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord Jesus, may your kingdom come as your will is done, just as it is done in heaven above, so too here on earth, Lord Jesus, and here in this parish, here in my heart, may you be king. And Lord Jesus, I might also ask that you have entrusted me with your kingdom. May I be a good steward of the kingship that I've received. Because I have been baptized with your baptism, I have drunk from the cup which you share with me. And so may I rule in my family, in my church, as you ruled with humility. May I lay down my life for those who are entrusted to my care. As a good shepherd, Lord Jesus, may I follow you who were struck and the sheep scattered. But when you were struck down, you gathered everyone together when you rose victorious on the cross. This is what I invite now into my heart, Lord Jesus. The power, the strength, the divinity, the glory of the cross. Jesus, draw me to yourself as you are lifted up. And so we pray together, our Father, how art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, 
is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.